Our guest today is the president of DePaul University. He has served as president for nearly seven years. Our guest today is a trustee of the Chicago History Museum. DePaul is the largest Catholic university in America. It is also the largest private university in the Midwest. He is a native of Detroit. Our guest today studied for the priesthood at Mary Immaculate Conception in Northampton, Northampton, Pennsylvania, and was ordained 22 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of DePaul, Father Dennis Holtzschneider. Father. Well, good afternoon. That was actually a little better than church. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I want to thank uh, Jay and Paul and the members and, uh, and the board of the City Club. Uh, it's uh, an honor to stand at this podium. Thank you for inviting me today. Um, I'd also like to uh, pay tribute to Tom Roser, um, who also did not always um, like everything about DePaul University. <laughs> uh, but but he, was a, he was a man of great conviction and integrity and honor, and I, I admired his faith to the, to the core. And so uh, he will be missed. He was an important part of our lives. Um, God bless him. Um, I love this city, um, not only for its architecture and its neighborhoods or its culture. Um, in my opinion, it's a great city because of its collective heart. With examples like the City Club, the Civic Committee, the Commercial Club, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, the uncountable civic and nonprofit boards, and the near nightly fundraisers <laughs> for one organization or another. You, you never need to cook in this city. Uh, this is a city of people who step up and try to make a difference. I've never seen anything like it, certainly not on this scale. It's a great testament to the concept of civic pride. This afternoon, if I may, I'd like to applaud and I'd like to echo the terrific presentation that was made by Chris Kennedy in March here at the City Club. For those of you who missed it, Chris described a virtuous cycle that higher education plays in great cities like Chicago. Um, he pointed to Boston as an example of university presidents and leaders of the business community and political community working closely together to achieve transformative results for the economies of cities. He focused particularly on the importance of federal support for university-based um, basic research, um, which creates applied research, which develops new technology that creates new businesses, which then pay new taxes that in turn fund schools and new research initiatives so that the cycle that repeats itself is self-reinforcing. It's not an efficient cycle, but it hits enough times to make a difference. It works in Boston because civic leaders, the business community, and the presidents of the leading universities work together with elected officials in a partnership that benefits Boston and keeps it vibrant. It's a useful strategy to create an environment where new industries can be built based on the ideas emerging from, from our universities. Um, I believe in federal funding of basic research, and there's a long and proven track record of universities being an outstanding place to do that work. But if I were advising city and state economic planning, at least as it concerns higher education, I would also focus on smart workforce development and do it through two avenues, strategic employment of financial aid dollars and coordinated planning. Let me explain each. There's a, no question to me that regional economies can grow as new products or technologies are introduced. But there's also the issue of a workforce. Very cool things may have been developed at MIT's nanotechnology labs, but you can be very sure 
that no startup industries would have taken root in Boston except for the fact that there was a highly educated workforce ready to be hired. If not, those discoveries and their attendant factories and companies would have gone somewhere else in the world. It's no accident that Silicon Valley is the center of the universe for high-tech companies. Numerous universities in the University of California system, as well as Stanford and other schools whose graduates dominate the industries there. It's the same in San Jose and Austin, Texas. Where there are sizable universities educating the local populace, commercial enterprises are more likely to take root. Now Groupon did not grow out of funding for university research so much as it grew out of our business schools. United, and I suspect Boeing, didn't relocate to Chicago to spin off technologies from research universities, but they were convinced that there was sufficient educated talent here to support their operations. When it comes to growing a local economy, the first and the primary contribution of universities is, and in my opinion, will likely remain an educated workforce. The challenge then is to get that local population educated and educated well. As we all know, a degree alone is not enough. The quality of learning matters. Companies aren't looking for a workforce, they're looking for the right workforce. In Illinois, like in Massachusetts or in New York, the private sector of higher education is a major player in that strategy. Um, here in Illinois, private nonprofit universities enroll a little more than 225,000 students in the state. The public institutions enroll about 200,000. That's a 53%, 47% split. And that doesn't even include the new rising for-profit sector. Um, here in Illinois, 55% of all the education degrees are coming from the private universities. 59% of the health degrees are, are coming from the private universities. 55% of minority students are being educated at the private institutions. You get the idea. It would cost the state a great deal if we were forced to recreate this educational system inside its public institutions. And so like many other states, Illinois created a system to assist state residents who attend these private colleges. The Monetary Assistance Fund, or MAP funds, are designed to assist students from Illinois families of great need to attend private institutions by giving them somewhere between $2,000 and these days about $4,500 depending on their financial situation. These are not large dollars when put against the size of college tuitions, but they often make all the difference. When st students work, when they seek out other kinds of financial aid, when they take out loans, this puts them over the top. So that's been the social strategy in Illinois to create an educated workforce, a public system to educate a little under half of the population, and then shift the rest of the demand toward private institutions with these grants. For their part, the private institutions have stepped up and they've offered extensive financial assistance of their own. Th that strategy is pretty stressed at the moment. As you can easily surmise, many more people in Illinois are now financially eligible for MAP funds as their family finances have been reduced in this economy. The for that forces the state to shrink the slices as they divide the pie or the pool of funding among a larger group of our residents. And last week, the MAP funds were cut further after a disastrous attempt to save money by eliminating the for-profit institutions from eligibility and then cutting the pool of funds by an equal amount. The measure eliminating the for-profits did not pass, but the proposed reduction in overall funds did. 
Um, the result is less funds shared by the original number of schools and ever more needy students. Now I understand that Illinois' financial challenges are real, so I'm slower than most to beat the state over the head in these moments. I merely mention this to make clear that the private institutions are pretty stressed right now, and some, are, some of them are looking for ways to survive. At DePaul, we've shifted money from our bottom line to assist those MAP students, as we call them, who are already at DePaul and would have to drop out if their MAP funding was reduced. Since we specifically recruit first-generation college goers at DePaul, and we're the largest private university in Illinois, um, that means we have a sizable number of MAP recipients. Um, and we don't run large margins at the university, so it's a significant commitment for us to pick up where the state left off. And that's where DePaul's soft heart kicks in. With St. Vincent DePaul's name over the door, um, we don't have the heart to tell students they need to drop out just because the state has had to reduce their aid. Make no mistake though, whatever the clothes I wear, I do have the steel-heartedness to accept fewer new students next year. DePaul simply can't make up the state's funding decisions. So in the end, the state will get whatever the state invests in. You don't get more with less, you get less with less. And that's certainly true when it comes to workforce education policy. DePaul for itself gives $135 million from our own bottom line back to students as financial aid from our coffers. We do that each year. It's a startling amount for a private university to do, and we're very proud of it. But even that has a limit. Um, the MAP partnership has been a good deal for the state up till now. For an investment of somewhere between $2,000 and $4,500 per student, the, sa the state sent its residents to universities like DePaul and many private schools um, for th to receive a $30,000 education. Um, we package those students with federal financial aid, with work opportunities, with our own institutional aid, and loans, though less than you might think. And we got them a first-class education. In so doing, the state of Illinois got an educated resident for a whole lot less cost than they would have spent had those women and men gone to the public institutions. DePaul and the other members of the private sector play a powerful role in Illinois in workforce development. And this does not even recognize that we often serve as <coughs> importers of talent. At any given time, DePaul has about 140,000 living alumni. About 112,000 of those live and work in greater Chicago. We're a powerful net importer of residents to Chicago. About two-thirds of the students who come to DePaul come from Chicago and its suburbs, but 80% of them stay after graduation, raise their families, and work here. And since the third of our students who come from the other 49 states and abroad are not eligible for Illinois MAP financial aid, Illinois essentially gets these new educated residents for free. But in the end, it's that funding plan known as MAP, that partnership of the state and the private sector that creates about 53% of the degrees granted in this state. There's your educated workforce. MAP funding makes a huge difference to our economy. No workforce or wrong workforce, no new industries. You understand then why I consider this not just an internal matter for the universities, but an economic matter for the region. But I told you there were two approaches I'd focus on today if I were advising on how higher education can leverage economic growth in the, in the state. The second is not so much an agenda of the private higher education sector. It's more my own observation that we could leverage economic growth more effectively if we worked in a more coordinated fashion. In short, 
I'm going to suggest that the city, the state, and regional planners put higher education in the room. For this, let me tell you some stories. When the Prime Minister of Bahrain invited DePaul to open a campus there, a recent challenge, <laughs> they came to us to help train their citizens in banking because the banking industry of the Middle East had moved to their small island kingdom. We agreed to do it and on the condition that we could educate Sunni and Shia, men and women, in the same classroom. To their great credit, they have always honored that agreement. When I met with the education minister in Thailand, he spoke of the need for English language instruction, for that nation is the least English proficient of all the countries in that region. And he spoke about that being the number one lever to raise his economy so that he could bring international business to his country. He simply needed to educate his populace and he needed to train teachers to teach English. And so that's what we've done. The mayor of Amman, Jordan, knew our real estate market and development expertise and he came looking for it. The education minister in Beijing, um, who turned out to be a uh, fellow Harvard grad, um, came to us looking for aviation law and intellectual property law. You might have heard they have a few issues around that. <laughs> we spoke to him about Mayor Daly's wish that we prepare Chicago public school teachers to teach Mandarin. He helped us create our program and we continue to conduct programs in aviation law and intellectual property law. Here's the story. Other countries know how to ask higher education institutions for what they need to build the particular economies they want to build. I'm very grateful that Mayor Emanuel is creating a faster track approval process for university master plans. If asked, I'd encourage him to consider having the city take a lead and asking universities to cooperate with the economic development plans. What kinds of businesses do we want to attract or home grow within the city? And how can our universities create appropriate programs for it? Maybe it's nanotechnology, maybe it's not. At DePaul, we decided recently to create one of the great hospitality programs in the United States. There are only four others at that level in the United States, Cornell, Florida, Texas, and in Las Vegas, UNLV. Chicago, however, is the third largest convention city. In the Midwest, the two largest programs are at Michigan State and Purdue, and neither one of them has a lot of tourism going on. <laughs> um, so in the year and a half that our program has been running, we've already jumped to 400 majors, and we're getting transfers from Michigan State, and I think we're about to get a faculty member from there as well. Um, we decided several years ago to support making Chicago a gaming center, but not as you've heard in the news lately. I mean computer gaming center. We've now built one of the top computer gaming programs in the country, the only one recognized in the top eight for its games in the United States. We've, the past two years running. We've created the largest graduate school of computer science in the nation. We've invested strongly in digital media to support the film industry's work here, not only in Hollywood. We've new programs in environmental sciences and sustainability to support those new industries. We've changed the way we deliver communications degrees, seeing that the industry is now asking for something very different from its employees these days. We've moved into, we're moving into health-related fields next. That field is changing rapidly as well, and we think we're poised to make a contribution. DePaul has grown from 15,000 to 25,000 students in the past 12 years. And all of that growth is new programs. We're sitting in our own planning meetings, judging where the industry appears to be going, figuring where the job opportunities might lie, and opportunistically investing in quite a few. It's worked out well enough for us in recent years, but it's completely different from my experience of working with world leaders. They think about 
where they want their local economies to grow, and they invite universities into the partnership. I can tell you this. If a planning office for Chicago called several of us together and said they wanted to build an educated workforce in a given area, I'd take that very seriously. I do in other countries. Why not here? In the end, I couldn't agree more with Chris Kennedy's virtuous cycle that shows how investment in basic research at research universities builds economies. It's also true that the major investment with the largest and most efficient payoff are efforts to use these universities to build the kind of workforce that truly serves the economy that you want to build. No workforce, wrong workforce, no economic growth. So let me be clear. If students lack the means to finance a high quality college education, our economy will suffer for lack of well-paired graduates in key fields. The virtuous cycle unravels. The City Club can, and I hope will, invite presidents from more of our Chicago area universities to learn more about their contributions to the city and perhaps begin a conversation about how we can develop a triangular relationship among higher education, business, and government. More than that, I hope you'll join me in urging our government political leaders to help set the agenda to get our business community and higher education community pulling in the same direction for the benefit of all Chicagoans. Chris Kennedy was right. The moment requires a critical mass of political, corporate, and educational leaders if we're gonna remain focused on the broad goals that undergird Chicago and Illinois' economy. When we work together, we accomplish great things. Thank you, and God bless the city of Chicago. By the way, one of my favorite things is to hear a university president give a talk. I want you to know it's, it's wonderful. It's just, any questions? I mean, you know, nothing? Sounds like a faculty meeting, you're all afraid. No, raise, I'm never afraid. Raise your hand, uh, it's only those with tenure ask. Uh, okay, Chris, you don't, you don't even write it out, go ahead. Um, the question, um, asked about the idea of uh, philanthropy in Chicago uh, and how that plays a role in the very topics of which I'm speaking in workforce development and other areas and how can universities support that through their own programming and preparing people in advancement. Um, I always tell people at DePaul that when you become a college president they take you in a secret room and they show you a secret handshake and it looks like this. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, was a, it was a new skill for me at, because when I took the job, all I knew about fundraising was second collections. So I went like this. Uh, thankfully, I have many talented people around me that help me do this every single day. Um, you, are, you are fully and wholeheartedly correct when you talk about um, philanthropy in Chicago. And I nodded my head to it in a humorous way at the beginning when I talked about the nightly dinners in every quarter of the city. Um, you never need cook in Chicago. And it's a, it's, it says something extraordinary about this city, about the way people step up. And I can tell you, our many, my many colleagues in higher education across the world are incredibly jealous of what we have in the United States, where they don't have that tradition of private philanthropy, and we do. What a difference it makes. Um, it, uh, I know of, I know, actually know of universities that actually have major programs in philanthropy and in training professionals for the field. Um, and I don't know of those, of those programs in Chicago, but I'll certainly have to go and take a look at them and see what's out there. Um, but it is, it is the, the case that, uh, that that is an area of where great professionalism is always required. And so thank you for bringing it up. Any other, yeah, uh, no one wants to write out questions. So speak out, Frank, Frank you, you don't have to, Frank, you're in this head table, go ahead. I'll stand, though. But make sure you stay on the grid. 
Yeah. <laughs> Frank's question talked about um, the fact that so many of our citizens begin their higher education in our two-year institutions, our city colleges, and even before that in our Chicago public schools. And he asked, how do universities play a role in partnership with these particular paths towards an education that actually would create the quality of, uh, of citizen, of, of employee, um, that, that can actually meet the new economy? Is that fair? It's fair. I have no idea. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, in truth, um, it is a, I, I think very highly of the city colleges, as you know, and I think very highly of their new leader. Um, she has a, a very tough job, and she is uh, not shrinking from it. And so we, uh, uh, we are proposed to help in any way we can. Um, DePaul University, you may or may not know, is the largest private transfer school in Illinois. I will do graduation, um, not this weekend, but next weekend. Um, 6,900 students will graduate from DePaul. Um, about 5,000 will come to graduation. I will shake every hand. They will cross stages in six ceremonies. Half of the hands that I shake will have started somewhere else. Um, it, is, it is an extraordinary thing um, of, of the ways that people find to build the future when what people think of as the traditional path through education was not available to them early on. And it, is a, it has been our experience that we can work effectively with those schools to get students um, to reach our standards by the time they finish and are ready to graduate. And so we actually have contracts and agreements with two-year colleges, not just in Chicago, but throughout the state. Um, that make very clear, here's, here's the courses that work for us, here's the standards. We work with the professors in those schools to say, here's what we need inside your courses. In, in many cases, we actually accept the students at the same time. They're accepted in a two-year college and they're already accepted to DePaul um, so that they can go to basketball games, they can use our library. Most importantly, they can use our advisors and they can find their way along the way. Um, our faculty, and our administrative team have found very, very creative ways to work with these institutions because many of these students simply don't have the resources to do a four-year private education, even with the aid that's available to them. And this is a wonderful way for them to get a start earlier on in a less expensive way, but finish in the same place. We've, uh, we've been watching their grades. We track, the students don't realize how much we track them, uh, <laughs> but we do. And we actually watch how well they do when they come into DePaul and follow their way through. There is sometimes a bit of an adjustment period when they first arrive, um, but they, they get up to speed. They have been prepared because they've been part of this program all along, and they are, they are testing just as well as our students at the end. I believe that four-year colleges and two-year colleges can work hand in glove. Not everyone does, but I believe it's simply because I've seen it. Um, one last question. Uh, wait, we have a, actually a written question following the rules. Well, why don't you state your question but in a very loud voice? Um, the question was, um, it's, uh, it's probably more of a question than just competent um, workers for industries that come to Chicago, but creating competent leaders. And how do you do that in a university effectively? And so we start by organizing them to protest math funds. <laughs> <laughs> so, in, in truth, actually, I think that might work. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> so, in truth, um, I, 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 uh, university life is more than just the coursework. University life are all the organizations, all the clubs, all the opportunities to lead and to grow. Um, we also insist at our university, because we ha again, we have the name St. Vincent de Paul over our door, that all of our students have to give back. They must all go out and serve. We put thousands of students throughout Chicago every quarter, serving in all the great um, social service industries and schools and um, many places to make a difference. But in the process, they learn to carry themselves, to speak, to be self-initiators, to work with the group, to follow and learn a new, a new culture. Um, it's, it becomes something that pays off for them as they're giving back. 
Um, and then what we often do is we tie it right to their courses. And so if they're learning biochemistry, we'll send them out to test water quality in sketchy neighborhoods. Or we'll have our tax students out doing the taxes with people who can't afford tax assistance. Or you know, we'll, we'll introduce them to all kinds of work depending what their major is and give them an opportunity to, to learn to make a difference right in their area of growth and, and expertise. So I think that becomes another way that we're able to do that because we ask that of all of our students. Um, and besides all the usual, every university has leadership programs, but in truth, they usually serve a smaller body of students because 25,000 students probably won't join that particular program. And so in the end, it's, it's wonderful to have those clubs and to have those opportunities, but you probably need to build it into the curriculum or it's not gonna touch them all. And that's been our approach in that sense. One written question and one verbal one. This is a nice softball for you, given what you guys just announced. Cynthia Thornton, a proud former DePaul parent. One area you did not mention is the fine arts. Ah. I know. DePaul has a strong tradition in that field. What are your plans? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just happened to have yesterday's speech at the groundbreaking. <laughs> Um, as you may have heard, um, in about 12 weeks, DePaul is going to open an art museum as a gift to the city of Chicago. Um, we have quietly been collecting for many, many years the history of Chicago art. And so that's defined in two ways. Either the, Chica the artist worked in Chicago um, or the artist came from Chicago and worked somewhere else. And it, come the beginning of September, um, we are going to give the city of Chicago an art museum um, that also serves us for our educational purposes as well. It will be right as you step off the L on Fullerton Avenue. In addition, yesterday we broke ground for a new school of theater. Our, it was the, the formerly the Goodman School of Theater that DePaul rescued a number of years ago. It's been top ten in the nation every single year, and we're finally going to give them a theater. They've been in a Catholic grade school all these years. We're finally going to give them a theater school with theaters in it. <laughs> uh, followed by that, um, we are in the design phase. Um, you may know our music school is considered actually one of the finest in the nation. And uh, we, um, we actually just had our first student who was accepted to Juilliard and DePaul simultaneously choose DePaul. Uh, but it, the, the faculty is quite extraordinary. We're going to give them a proper music school a couple years down the road. Um, DePaul is investing very heavily in the arts right now um, in a way that makes other universities step up and take notice because these are not programs that have return on investment in any kind of financial way. Um, we do it because we believe that, that universities should always be a combination of programs that do bring in resources so that you can support the intellectual endeavors of the world that don't. And certainly that you could support the development of the next generation of artists, because if you don't, who will? So that, that's a very strong commitment by behalf of our board, many of whom are here today. Thank you very much. One more question. Father, you've gotten off kind of easy from with this crowd, kind of a sort of a setup crowd here. Back in the good old days, you used to get McDonald's All-Americans. Your basketball team was doing great stuff. I mean, are you becoming sort of the new Loyola? <laughs> Is uh, Mike Garanzini in the room? <laughs> so, um, I, I assume you're, you're admiring our uh, Sweet 16 women's basketball team this year? Absolutely. <laughs> And perhaps our women's softball team that just went to the NCAAs and did very well. That, of course, is all to give Oliver Purnell a little bit of cover as he <laughs> rebuilds the team. Um, but you may know, if you follow, that he has six new players all teed up for next year, and we're pretty excited. So on that, I'll simply say, pray for us. <laughs> 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 <laughs>